morning, everyone. Uh, I think we could just start with uh, a short repetition of what we did last time. We introduced what was known as the Hamilton formalism as an alternative but equivalent sort of framework for analyzing mechanical problems uh, as compared to the Lagrangian formalism. And the, the bridge between these two formalisms was the so-called Legendre transformation, which essentially consisted of um, a mathematical way to exchange coordinates. Because in the Lagrange formalism, we operate with the generalized coordinate Q, its time derivative Q dot, and time as sort of the descriptive uh, variables. In the Hamilton formalism, we use the generalized coordinate Q and the canonical momentum P associated with this generalized coordinate Q and time. And so the prescription to go from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian was to simply subtract the uh, product of the two variables we wanted to interchange. So in fact, we subtracted the product between Q dot and P in order to make this le uh, Legendre transformation. <clears throat> so that was then. Uh, today, we're going to start on a new topic. <clears throat> the two body problem, and in particular, an emphasis will be placed on central forces. And from a historical point of view, this problem um, was mainly used uh, to characterize planetary motion. <clears throat> So you can think of, for instance, the sun and the earth as a two-body problem, a planet orbiting a star. Um, so you'll see many analogies as we proceed into this topic for how we can use this for planetary, to characterize planetary motion. But that is just one uh, possible area of application for this field. I can give you some good news right away, and that is that a two-body problem where you have central forces acting between the two bodies can be reduced to an effective one-body problem. And that's good news because we then reduce the degrees of freedom from the degrees of freedom associated with two bodies to one body. And this allows for a simpler characterization of the system. So let's see how this can be done. Assume we have two particles here, or objects of some kind, uh, with position vectors r1 and r2. <clears throat> 
Now assume these objects have masses m1 and m2, and that the center of mass for this system, the two objects, is located here. We then introduce two relative position vectors, which give the coordinates of these two objects relative to the center of mass. And these are denoted R1 prime and R2 prime. And finally, we introduce the relative position vector between the two objects, r. So it's the vector between m1 and m2. One more thing. Large r is the position of the center of mass. If we have two bodies and no further constraints, it means we have six degrees of freedom. Three degrees of freedom for each particle, since it can move in three directions. Now, from the definition here of the relative position vector, small r, and the center of mass position vector, large r, from this figure, we see that this is the center of mass coordinate. Uh, this is just its definition. Whereas this is, uh, sorry, yeah, this is the relative position vector expressed by the position vectors of object one and object two. So as mentioned, we're going to concern us, uh, ourselves with central forces. So we assume that. We also see that the system is conservative. <clears throat> if we make these assumptions, it follows that the potential energy may be written as a function solely of this relative position vector and moreover solely as a function of its magnitude. So all that matters is the distance between these two particles. All right. So in order to analyze this problem and its sort of mechanical properties, how, it, how it's going to evolve with time, the first step is to Yes, sir. Always write up the Lagrangian. Now, I have written the kinetic energy as a function of the derivative of the center of mass coordinates and the derivative of the relative position vector. Now, this is equivalent to using the time derivative of R1 and R2. I could just, have, yeah, just as well have used that if I wanted to. There are still six degrees of freedom. Three coordinates uh, and the time derivative of each one, and the same here. 
So whether I use R1 and R2 to describe the kinetic energy or the center of mass position vector and the relative position vector, it uh, doesn't matter. OK, so let's have a look at the kinetic energy first. Well, this is the fundamental expression. And here I used R1 and R2. But since I would like to express the kinetic energy in terms of the center of mass coordinate and its relative uh, and the relative position vector, I have to transform this to our new coordinates here somehow. Now, the reason for why I want to use the center of mass coordinate and the relative position vector is that the potential energy depends on R. So instead of using R1, R2, and R, it's more convenient just to use small r and large r. So the task at hand is to transform this expression to something expressed by these coordinates. I get this upon inspection of this figure. which should give me this when I multiply out the squares. Now, from the definition of the center of mass, this term is zero. Okay, so then I have the following, where I've introduced this T prime term. Now, if we just pause briefly and consider this expression, what it means physically, it seems quite reasonable because we show that the kinetic energy consists of a center of mass term where you have the total mass and the center of mass coordinates here. And then you have T prime, which consists of the kinetic energy relative to the center of mass. In effect, how do the particles or objects one and two move compared or relative the central mass here, the time derivative of the relative position vectors here, R1 prime and R2 prime. Yes? Should the R1 prime and R2 prime be defined in zero? Yes, absolutely. Thanks. So we see that the kinetic energy consists of a central mass term and a relative term compared to the center of mass. And this is something we encountered 
uh, previously in this course when we considered rotational motion, where we saw that the kinetic energy associated with an object that was rotating could be decomposed into a rotation around the origin of the coordinate system and its rotation around its own axis, its spin, so to speak. So, so far it seems reasonable. But let's see if we can make some further simplifications uh, with this T prime term, since we ultimately would like to express the kinetic energy solely in terms of the center of mass and relative coordinates. And I'll just give you the final result here by using the definitions of R prime, R1 prime and R2 prime, and relating them to the center of mass position vector here and the relative coordinate. You can show after some straightforward algebra that the quantity T prime can be expressed like this. So we basically reduced the expression for the kinetic energy to depend only on the movement of the central mass and the relative movement of the two particles expressed through this term. Now, let's try to simplify this a bit and introduce a new quantity, which is this reduced mass. This is known as the reduced mass. And we denote it mu. We also introduce the total mass of the system, just the sum of m1 and m2. If we do so, we end up with the following Lagrangian. Center of mass, kinetic energy, relative motion, kinetic energy, and the potential energy or the interaction between these particles. Now, I announced in the beginning that there was some good news. We would be able to reduce this two-body problem to an effective one-body problem. Have we managed to do so? Is this a one-body problem? That's true. But would you say it's a one body problem? 
How many degrees of freedom would you expect for a one body problem? And how many do we have here? We still have six. Unfortunately, and this is because we still have this pesky center of mass coordinates. Now, probably we won't be able to do anything about the relative coordinate because this is embedded in the potential energy. So this is just interaction between the particles. If we were able to get rid of this term somehow, we would have one body problem. But we can't just drop it without any uh, reasoning behind it. Now, please take one minute to discuss with your neighbor. Is there any way we can justify to get rid of this central mass term? Okay, do, I, do we have any suggestions? Yes. If we have translation of symmetry in the problem, uh, we will end up with uh, an effective one body problem which moves linearly through space. So we can use a Galilei transformation to move to the still standing system and end up with an effective three degrees of freedom. Uh, yes, I think you're onto something. I didn't quite catch everything. Um, I think what you said is correct. You said something about translational symmetry. Could you expand a bit on that? This is um, <coughs> in the potential. Mm -hmm. The potential is only dependent on the distance between the particles. And so the system as a whole is um, unchanged if both particles move an equal distance in, the, in direction. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So what you're saying, if I understand it correctly, is that if you move the entire system, both objects, simultaneously, there is no change in the Lagrangian. Or expressed mathematically, there is no dependence on the center of mass coordinates. There is only a dependence on its time derivative. But this Lagrangian is independent on large r. So the formal term for this situation is that large R is a cyclic coordinate. This was a term we introduced a couple of lectures ago, I think. That if the Lagrangian is independent on one specific generalized coordinate, that coordinate is cyclic. And then we should know something. What happens if we have a cyclic coordinate? We have a symmetry. The coordinate is cyclic, which means Yes, conservation of momentum. Yes. So the physical insight is that L is independent on the center of mass coordinate. So we have a symmetry in the system. Which, as you say, means that something is conserved. And that something is the canonical momentum associated with large R.
So the canonical momentum defined as follows has to be a constant. Which means that R dot has to be a constant, since M is a constant. OK. So this means that the first term in the Lagrangian has to be invariant. It doesn't change with time. So we can just consider it as a constant quantity. Now, can we then make any further simplifications for the Lagrangian if the first term is just a constant? Why? Because all the quantities were at the derivatives of the Lagrangian, and uh, then the another constant for the Um Yes. So you mean that all the quantities we're after are only derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to? Uh, yes, that's true, but we also, we don't know beforehand that we can just disregard, for instance, dl d large r dot. That's also derivative. But as you say, we can just drop this term because it can effectively be absorbed into the potential energy as simply a redefinition of the reference level for potential energy. We can always add a constant to the potential energy without changing the physics. That's just saying, okay, we change our reference level from here to here. So this term can just be absorbed into the potential energy, which means that we can remove it. You see what I mean? Mm. Right. Let me think a little. I think you're right. Yeah. So what he's saying is that uh, removing this constant is equivalent to changing our reference system to the center of mass system. Uh, I'm not sure it's completely equivalent because if the center of mass system is accelerated, we're introducing new types of effects, because then it's no longer an inertial system. Um, but then again, the central mass system isn't accelerated because of this. Yes? Didn't, didn't we assume that all forces were central? Mm -hmm. And then uh, there, that, uh, those forces wouldn't matter anyway? Uh, the only forces in the system are the forces between the particles. Um, so they're included in this potentially here. Uh, how do you mean that they don't matter? Well, that, um, so if the both the particles move mm. uh, simply in the same direction, mm. then there would be forces due to that. Uh, All right. Yeah, that's true. So if if we just move the center of mass, the interaction between the particles shouldn't change, as you say. Yeah. So I think you're correct. Um, removing this term should just correspond to a Galilean transformation like you said, changing the reference system. Because both are moving with constant velocities compared to each other. There's no acceleration. So based on this, we can drop the first term.
And now we have reduced the problem to an effective one body problem. like this. And you see that the, the effective mass we have to deal with is this reduced mass. So for central forces um, and two bodies, you can always reduce this problem to an effective one body problem associated with the relative motion of the two objects. Right, so related to what uh, you said, I think I understand better now. So you said that if we just add a constant to the Lagrangian, it doesn't matter because all that enters in the Lagrange equations are derivatives with respect to some coordinates. So you're right. If, if we know that this is a constant, then we know that we can just drop it. But to begin with, we can't just drop it because we don't know if uh, the Lagrangian derivative with respect to r large r dot is zero or a constant. So this is the Lagrangian we have to work with and now we're ready to have a look at the equations of motion or the Lagrange equations. <coughs> 